Thanks very much, Joe, and, and welcome and hello to you all. It's um, a great pleasure to be here, and I, you know, really looking forward to hearing from Rosie. So I'll keep this short and sweet. But just for a tiny bit of background, Rosie's a criminologist and clinical speech pathologist with expertise in the assessment of complex disorders of literacy acquisition and their treatment. She's also a facilitator of personal courage development and non-violent communication with the Centre for Courage and Renewal. In this short presentation, Rosie will talk about relational trust, the four essential elements that lead to relational trust and applying these principles when teaching adults to read and write. Rosie's based down in Tasmania and I must say that there are a lot of wonderful things happening there and it's a great pleasure to introduce her and welcome her this afternoon. So thank you, Rosie. Thank you for having me on and for the opportunity to come and speak with you all as well. So thank you to ACAL and to Daniela and to, and to everybody involved. It's, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to join with others in this work that I think we're all very passionate about. So um, my, just picking up on what Daniela was saying about me, I uh, founded a charity a few years ago called Chathamatis Tasmania and its objects are about bringing support for language, literacy and positive relatedness into cohorts that um, uh, could uh, benefit and be enriched by access to the kinds of services that speech pathologists are able to bring and, uh, you know, and just trying to spread uh, the really fabulous news about communication and connectedness which we know is really what empowers us as human beings. And part of my professional development and pursuing my own interest in positive communication and non-violent communication over the last few years have led me to become a facilitator with an organisation that's based in the US that has a number of facilitators also here in Australia. Uh, the organisation is called the uh, Centre for Courage and Renewal and um, that's been really beautiful work of, um, you know, for me it's been kind of everything that I feel is kind of mapping out what I have learned about as a speech pathologist across many years to how that applies not only how those, those skills and those insights apply not only with people who have challenges in their communication, but to all of us who um, might have normal communication skills as measured by standardised tools, but, um, but we all have challenges in communication because human beings are complex. And um, so I've been really interested in that area of work as well. So, um, so the Centre for Courage and Renewal is also one of the organisations that I'm connected with. There's a beautiful quote by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I think this is how I feel about communication generally. But I think it's also true about the work we're doing in adult literacy that um, you know when some people don't have the skills to be able to access all that they need to be able to access to live life to the fullest and in a flourishing way, then actually we're all impacted by that. And certainly, you know, my criminology studies have really shown that clearly, that uh, equity of opportunity and provision of opportunity in rich and abundant ways across all of society is a way to actually you know, create safety in society. So um, I just want to start really with this quote. Uh, by G sorry, Jean Vanier, who says, as we start to really get to know others, as we begin to listen to each other's stories, things begin to change. We begin the movement from exclusion to inclusion, from fear to trust, from closeness to openness, from judgment and prejudice to forgiveness and understanding. It is a movement of the heart and it's that movement of the heart and that notion of um, fulfilling the riches that we can be as human beings in our human status that has interested me and um, you know, and has led to uh, you know, this interest in relational trust which is what I want to talk about now. So relational trust, it's actually it's a specific form of trust that arises from the interaction between people. So social exchanges, if you like, between people. But it's not just that it, it's really, it's about that social interaction. And I'm going to want to talk a little bit more about it. But before I do, I just want to share this little piece of, uh, this quote with you from a woman by the name of Lynn Fiskus. And she's quoted in this book, which I just want to show you. I'm just going to flash it up. It is in the uh, references at the end. But I just 
want to flash it up in front of my camera so that you can see it. So it's this book called The Courage Way by Shelley Francis. And Shelley has become a sweet friend of mine over the last couple of years in my involvement in the courage work. And she writes this really very beautiful book about what is it that brings us courage? And you know, where does it come from? What are its parts? How is it, how is it structured? How does it look? How do we grow it in our lives? And Lynn Fiskus uh, was a physician in America, or is a physician in America. And she made this comment to Shelley when Shelley was interviewing her for this book. She said, I feel that what makes trapeze artists so successful is they just have ultimate trust in one another. That's part of what's really hard about this work. So she was talking about her work as a physician. That's, what's part of what, that's part of what's really hard about this work is that we've still got a big deficit in trust organisationally. And I think that Lynn has really hit on something there, that if we don't have an abundance and a richness in trust uh, between us in whatever our communities might be, whether it's the community of a family, the community of a workplace, you know, the broader community, then actually we feel like it's all, it can be really hard work. And we can feel that our communication efforts are a struggle. And so I just want to pick up again on this concept of relational trust. So uh, it's a trust that emerges from the interactions between people as opposed, for instance, to the idea of contractual trust. So contractual trust is a bit more of a kind of a legal concept and a legal obligation where it might be that we trust somebody because of the contract that we have in place that they will deliver particular services. But it might not um, contain the same elements of relational trust that we would like to see for real flourishing abundance and the satisfaction of our deeply human needs in relationships with one another. And uh, so I want to talk about relational trust a little bit more because we are dependent on one another and we're vulnerable to misunderstandings, to power imbalances, to breakdowns in communication, um, our personal resiliences are different from each other. Uh, we can be dysregulated and become upset or um, unable to be focused in our in our work um, if we find that we're being stirred or our emotions are being stirred from other areas in our life. And just on this concept, what I want to put up next is this um, concept of shark music. So one of the pieces of work that I've been doing at the prison here in Tasmania is teaching a program called the Circle of Security. And for those who know it, um, you'll know that it's a really beautiful program on uh, parent-child attachment. And for those who don't know it, it's really something that's worth engaging with. I think um, you know if you've ever, if you're a parent or um, or if you're not a parent, if you know children, it's really there's a, there's a lot in it that's very rich to actually fulfil us and give us uh, new quality in life because of a deep knowledge of attachment and its beauty and its mechanisms. But one of the particular concepts that they raise in this program is this concept called shark music. And shark music is the Jaws music. So you know, if you're of the generation that watched Jaws and was terrified by it, you will remember that beat and that kind of heightening pace of the music as, it, um, as the shark was getting closer. And, and it's, there's a lovely moment in the program where there's a, a video segment that pans across a beautiful ocean scene with the sun shining and then it turns around, pans around and comes down a forested pathway and then out onto the beach. And the first time that one sees this bit of footage, classical music is playing in the background and it's beautiful and you, would, you get down to the beach and you feel like you might have a dip. Then they play exactly the same piece of video footage again but with the shark music playing in the background. And by the time you get down to the beach, you're quite sure that you're not going to go in the water. And the point that's being made out of that is that the emotional backgrounding of our lives and the way that the shark music in this example is the soundtrack backgrounding to the, um, the scene that's being presented, the, the, the metaphor is to hook into the fact that the emotional backgrounding of our lives actually can have an impact in our present when in fact it's something from our past that might not be dangerous to us anymore, but it's setting off experiences as if it's dangerous. And so for all of us, at all times in our lives, there are elements of other parts of our lives that might be impinging upon us in shark music kind of way, which we might not be entirely conscious of 
And it's interesting now, having presented the circle of security many times, I've had this comment come many times when this particular section has been presented, where people who have just watched both pieces of footage will say, but that was a different piece of footage that you showed the second time. Like the second time, like it was a dull day, like the sky was all grey and it was like this really gloomy day. But in fact, it's exactly the same piece of footage, but it's been coloured by that emotional backgrounding. So for all of us, we are coloured by that emotional backgrounding and we might not always be conscious of it. So we're full of sharp music and full of influences that are in our personal unknowns. And therefore there's a need to attend to one's own self-awareness because the self-awareness actually, it's bit, you know, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, um, is that our relational trust comes from our inner perception and their interpretations of the behaviour and motives of others. So it looks at first like it's between people, but it's in the interactions between people and our interactions are coloured by our own inner perceptions and interpretations, which can be influenced by all of those things that I listed before and then step thought to summarise in the idea of shark music, so misunderstandings, power imbalances, breakdowns in communication and so on our shark music. And so because of that, um, you know, then, you know, heading into relationships with others, of course it's rich and beautiful, but they can also be shark ridden waters and uh, there can be lots of uh, jumping at shadows. And so this idea um, and the slide that I have up there presently of honest, critical and kind observation of self and reflective attention to one's own self-awareness is actually a really powerful way for being able to support um, the steadiness that we can have in the relational trust with others that we're working with and others in our networks. And this idea of honest, critical and kind observation of self and reflective attention of our self-awareness is a completely different creature to self-indulgence, but rather it's seeking to look and engage honestly with that which is not known about ourselves in order to be able to quiet the shark music, if you will, and then be able to bring the best of ourselves in um, relational trust building to the networks that we're part of. So I just next want to read you um, a piece that um, it's called the, the Parable of the Trapeze and it's a piece of writing by Danan Parry and it's easily found online but it's really quite a beautiful piece, it's longish so, um, so I'd like you just to sit back actually and enjoy this, close your eyes, you're probably somewhere in a room on your own um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an inquiry or just an opportunity to think into um, who am I in my, relation to, my relationship to trust? So the parable of the trapeze, turning the fear of transformation into the transformation of fear. Sometimes I feel that my life is a series of trapeze swings. I'm either hanging onto a trapeze bar swinging along or for a few moments in my life I'm hurtling across space in between trapeze bars. Most of the time I spend my life hanging on for dear life to my trapeze bar of the moment. It carries me along at a certain steady rate of swing and I have the feeling that I am in control of my life. I know most of the right questions and even some of the answers. But every once in a while, as I'm merrily or even not so merrily swinging along, I look out ahead of me into the distance and what do I see? I see another trapeze bar swinging toward me. It's empty. And I know in that place in me that knows that this new trapeze bar has my name on it. It is my next step, my growth, my aliveness coming to get me. In my heart of hearts, I know that for me to grow, I must release my grip on this present, well-known bar and move to the new one. Each time it happens to me, I hope, no, I pray, that I won't have to let go of my old bar completely before I grab the new one. But in my knowing place, I know that I must totally release my grasp on my, new, on my old bar and for some moment in time, I must hurtle across space before I can grab onto the new bar. Each time I am filled with terror, 
it doesn't matter that in all my previous hurdles across the void of unknowing I have always made it. I am each time afraid that I will miss, that I will be crushed on unseen rocks in the bottomless chasm between bars. I do it anyway. Perhaps this is the essence of what the mystics call the faith experience. No guarantee, no net, no insurance policy, but you do it anyway, because somehow to keep hanging on to that old bar is no longer on the list of alternatives. So, for an eternity that can last a microsecond or a thousand lifetimes, I soar across the dark void of the past is gone and the future is not yet here. It's a quick transition. I have come to believe that this transition is the only place that real change occurs. I mean real change, not the pseudo change that only lasts to, until the next time my old buttons get punched. I have noticed that in our culture, this transition zone is looked upon as a no thing, a no place, between places. Sure, the old trapeze bar was real and that new one coming towards me I hope that's real too. But the void in between? Is that just a scary, confusing, disorienting nowhere that must be gotten through as fast and as unconsciously as possible? No. What a wasted opportunity that would be. I have a sneaking suspicion that the transition zone is the only real thing and the bars are illusions we dream up to avoid the void where the real change, the real growth, occurs for us. Whether or not my hunch is true, it remains that the transition zones in our lives are incredibly rich places. They should be honoured, even savoured. Yes, with all the pain and fear and feelings of being out of control that can, but not necessarily, accompany transition, they are still the most alive, most growth-filled, passionate, expansive moments in our lives. to invite you to notice what was occurring for you as you listen to that. If we had more time, I'd ask you to write it down. I just want you to notice. I think human interaction is filled with moments something like that void in the trapeze, between the trapezes, where we're uncertain about what's coming next, uncertain about how things might happen next. And it's this that I want to explore further. I want to look at the four elements of relational trust. Because attending to the quality of our relationship in the vagaries of the way that we are as human beings is how we will come to learn to trust each other. And Margaret Wheatley, who's a, um, an organisational manage management consultant, she says this, she makes a comment that nothing else works. Attending to the quality of our relationships matters because nothing else works. No new tools or technical applications, no redesigned organisational chart the solution is each other. If we can rely on one another, we can cope with almost anything. Without each other, we retreat into fear. So the fear or lack of trust typically translates into attempting to avoid or control a situation. So let's look at what are the four elements of relational trust that can really build our capacity to be able to be in the tension of our work with others and our time with others. First one is respect. And I think we probably all have a sense of what respect is. It's that deep understanding of another. In fact, I've come to enjoy really looking into what is inside of this world in terms of its Latin, in its Latin origins, which is read again and spect or to look. So it really means to look again. It, the word invites us to look again and see the human value again. It, the word invites us to look again and see the human value of another that maybe we didn't see on first glance for whatever reason. Maybe the shark music was in our way. Maybe instead of understanding self and groundedness in self, 
there was some interference so that we didn't get the opportunity to really see the value and the and the uh, the worth in another human being. But if we're invited to respect and look again, then actually there's a change that can occur, not necessarily in the other person, but in the way that we are looking, the way that I am looking at somebody else. And that is the, a piece about respecting, enabling me to be able to see something that I didn't see before and to find that of value. So respect is one of the first elements of relational trust. Is the first element. Personal regard is the other, or is the second. And by personal regard, what is meant uh, here is uh, is the care for one another. So to take the time to be able to personally care, um, is to take the kind of time to personally care. Sorry, I'm just getting messages that I'm fielding at the same time about this not being quite loud enough. So my apologies. Um, so personal regard is is Care. So it's in addition to respect, but actually going that extra um, uh, little bit of an extra distance, really, to show that that uh, respect has happened and that it's transforming as action to be cared for. And the third is competence. And you'll notice that there's not four on here because I want to just interject and spend a little bit of time talking about competence and I'll reveal the fourth a little bit later. And in particular I want to talk about the competence in relation to our work teaching adults to read and write. And uh, the competence that we need to have as practitioners and the competence within our organisations to support us as practitioners and the competence in the kind of relational trust that we're seeking to develop with our clients. And I want to just point out the, um, the word literacy um, came into the English language from uh, the Latin word literati, which means um, letters, so it simply means alphabetical, alphabet um, characters. So literacy in its in the earliest days of the use of this word, and its word has come to be, sorry, its meaning has come to be broadened out quite considerably more. But in its original entry into the English language, it meant to be lettered, to be able to decode that language which uh, is spoken into a written form that's placed upon the page. And so written script is language which has been placed upon a page or screen. In the case of English, using a code based upon the speech sounds, the phonemes. And writing, as we know, is the ability to encode spoken language into the visual form of written script. And reading, the ability to decode the written script back into its spoken language form. And I think this relationship between um, reading and speaking, between language in its oral form and language in its written form, um, it has, I think, I think there's been sources of confusion across time that they are both forms of language but they are based on the one symbol system that we have and our literacy, our ability to be literate and to use ourselves as literate people is the skill or the capacity really of both encoding and decoding language in the fullness of all that language is and all that language can be used for. So what is it that we need to make us competent and to help us to be competent practitioners in undertaking our work with our, um, our clients who, who need support in these areas. So the first of these competencies um, are in the knowledge of the sub-skills of language and literacy. So understanding that language itself is made up of many parts, it's um, made up of syntax, of morphemes, it's vocabulary, there's meaning involved. And in terms of the sub-skills of literacy, then we need to be able to lean into an understanding about phonemic awareness and the connection between the sounds, the phonemic sounds that we hear and the letters of the language, so the phonics area and how these link together. And then to become so automatic in those, um, in that making those linkages, that that can then be linked into that bigger picture of what language is in its in its fullness, which is where that it then hooks in again to um, skill with uh, syntax and with morphemes and with all of the elements of language. And I think a really thorough knowledge of those subskills and a curiosity about how those subskills link together, not to minimise any of them, but to maximise all of them because they all have a role to play in giving us the capacity to be able to be literate um, in the fullness of all that language is and the full beauty of language. 
So a continual curiosity in a growing knowledge about the soft skills of language and literacy. I work with a colleague, um, Linda McKillop is her name. She's a speech pathologist who spent all of her working career as a speech pathologist. She's been, uh, she's about the same age as me, so she's been in the business for about more than 30 years. And um, she has just, you know, she's just a role model in many ways in that she is just endlessly curious about this and recognises that there's always more to learn, that we never get to the point of knowing all of these um, these sub-skills and the, you know, the areas, the new research that's coming out and how these things connect to each other. So I think one of the really important competencies which enables our clients to have trust in us and for us to be able to build um, trust in our organisations and vice versa um, is in being um, determined actually to continue to grow our, our knowledge in these areas. Um, the other is uh, the, a sequence, a knowledge of the, excuse me, the sequence of the development of those skills. So this can differ for different people at different times, but we know that there is a broad overarching sequence of development um, and we can follow that as a template for our starting places and for a, what do we step to next. But also a knowledge of impaired development. So when people have uh, difficulty with learning to read and write or to use language and to produce speech for whatever reason, then actually understanding what, are the, what the processes are in those impaired capacities is also really powerful for being up for informing uh, the steps that we would then take to uh, make response to that. The ability to be able to teach directly and explicitly, so to be able to pair back the uh, you know the other uh, elements of language or phonemic awareness or phonics or whatever the the, uh, the other elements might be, but to pair back those that are not specifically relevant to the mastery of this particular sub-skill and present the particular sub-skills one by one as they're, as they're needed, gaining mastery in those, practicing those, building up explicit knowledge of them and then linking them back into that other sequence that we know about. But that ability to be able to pair away the variables that are not relevant at this moment in order to support and focus a client's ability on the variable that is the most important variable for them to develop their skill. That really matters. Excuse me. Um, the next point that I've got there is ubiquitous linking to metacognition. So it's really critical to be able to support um, learners by, you know, as they master something and begin to understand, uh, you know, a new skill based on the direct teaching of the sub-skill that we might have given to continually link that to the bigger picture of what's going on with their, uh, with their learning and how this is going to be a fit with the pathway that they're taking to really gain mastery, that this is just a little sub-skill that's being practiced but it's an important building block in order to gain mastery at that bigger picture level. But also to link it to their noticing, that they're able to notice whether or not they've, um, you know, they've attempted an activity or attempted that skill and they might have made an error. If they notice that error, then they're well on the way to actually being able to shift and make change. So constantly linking everything that's being learned to their thinking about what they're learning, they're thinking about their language and they're thinking about their thinking. So constantly supporting them to notice what's going on in the thinking, what's going on in their mind, what's going on in their body, what's going on in their experience as, they, um, as they're working. And also linking that to hope and aspiration so that the language we're using around um, our clients, even when they're struggling with maybe mastery of a particular skill, that without being unrealistic and without minimising the importance of mastery of that skill, um, that we're constantly linking that this struggle that they're feeling right now is a part of the pathway to get to the place that they're hoping to go and to open up new doors for them and new opportunities to be able to uh, you know, really have mastered the, the work that they're doing. So constantly using language of hope and um, aspiration I think is really important. Um, I put there applied behaviour analysis and what I mean by that is the this is really the ability to be able to break down tasks into their component parts. And so for us as therapists or interventionists, practitioners in whatever our background experience might be, to know that when we run into something that the client can't do 
and knowing that it's part of the sequence of skills that they need to be able to master and it's one of the important sub-skills of um, you know, for them to master to achieve that aspiration, then actually if they can't do it, we need we need to break it down for them so that they can do it. If it's if we know that it's an essential skill on the sequence or in the sequence and they can't do it, then you know, when I encounter that situation, I consider that my work then is to find the way to help them to do it, not to give it a rest until next time, or give it a rest, or maybe they've maybe this is too tricky for them, or sometimes actually it might be too tricky for them. But that's the point about task analysis: is that we then want to break it down into something that is just um, still in the sequence, very slightly easier, but still moving forward in the sequence, and always looking for and understanding that. You know, when we know those processes of the subskills of language and literacy completely, and we know the sequence of development, there is always a way to break the task that a client can't do down into small enough steps that they can do it. And I think one of the really important um, skills for all of us is to be able to do um, behaviour analysis of these or task analysis um, really very thoroughly, and also to be able to use reinforcement schedules well. So. Um, if a client is having a struggle with, with a skill but then they just they just manage to have a little breakthrough and they get it, obviously to give reinforcement for that in whatever way is going to work for them as reinforcement, which you know might be a big cheer or you know it might be a oh well done or, or you know however that would go, it might be a high five. Um, but then reinforcement schedules, if we keep the same reinforcement happening all the time, it kind of loses its interest. And so we need to be really skilled and really fluent at just being able to vary the reinforcement that we're using and know when it's time to drop back to doing random reinforcement uh, for the skills that a client is mastering because as a client starts to get mastery of a new skill, if we then begin to reinforce that, that activity or that skill randomly, we're, we're going to be more powerful at establishing that skill. Um, rather than kind of making them feel like our reinforcement is inauthentic, if we drop back to a random reinforcement schedule, unfortunately, you know, it's the random reinforcement is the reason that gambling is so addictive and that um, mobile phones are so addictive, uh, is because they, you know, we experience them in a randomly reinforced way, and so they become really powerfully um, psychologically addictive. But we can use random reinforcement. Um, in a way that's really positive when we're randomly reinforcing these skills that we want clients to learn. And maintenance of engagement is obviously really important. So, um, you know, we have a saying in our area of ther in, in therapy which we talk about, you know, making ourselves the, uh, well actually when we're working with children we say make ourselves the toy. We're working with adults, making ourselves this point of interest because in making ourselves a point of interest, we're connecting in a relational way that is itself very opening of um, trust and connection, which supports the fact that somebody is going to be working with us on um, tasks that are hard. Ready shifts in register is one of the other areas of competency, I think, for really connecting and building relational trust with our clients. Because if we can just adjust our talking, and the way that we connect in order to be a little bit more like them, and like the way that they are talking. Most people, the greatest majority of people, do not experience that as patronising. They experience that as really as actually being uh, a, a deeper kind of connection because they can recognise and feel themselves in that. So shifting the way that we use our voicing is really, is really powerful. And also reading emotional regulations, keeping a really close check, being attuned to clients' responses to ensure that they're um, that they're staying with us, and if they're not, that we might you know just give them a little spell or break the task down or make a shift or have a conversation about what might be going on. Also, integration of multisensory activity, and by this I don't mean shaving cream and I don't mean sandpaper. Um, what I mean is it's actually just simply using one's body. I mean, learning to read is already a multisensory activity. We're using our eyes, we've got visual information coming in, we're using our ears, there's sound-based information coming in. 
but also you know, as we're writing, we're using our muscles, and so that's um, you know, information that's you know, proprioceptively based and kind of aesthetically based as well. But being able to actually use the you know, hands to trace letters or fingers to trace letters, this is what I mean by multisensory activity. And so being aware of that and pointing that out to the clients as well. It's also our steadiness in task. And one of the other things that I, you know, that I do miss is really liking the client. If I think if, if I find myself in a situation where I don't find the client so easy to warm to immediately, that's a red flag for me that I'm not doing my job in the way that I would choose to do it. And um, and so, you know, I, I, what I want to do is respect, is to look again and find in that person maybe something that I didn't see the first time in order to actually be able to draw um, a liking and a connection with the client and a desire to be connected to that client from a really authentic place, not from a place that's inauthentic. And then obviously understanding the entire communication context. So, you know, for all of us we sit inside of all of the bigger contexts of our lives and as to our clients. And so being aware of those um, elements and um, and connecting those. And I think um, thinking about those competencies, then look and again looking at these four elements of relational trust, respect, personal regard, competence, and the fourth one is integrity, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. But I, I will just say at this point that if there's any weakness in relational trust, one of the things that could be really powerful to um, support what might be actually going on that's making this uh, you know, relationship either in this workplace or with this particular client or amongst these people, um, what's actually you know, eroding that trust? And looking at each of these four pieces in turn I think is a really powerful way sometimes to be able to put a finger on what might be going on in order to then consider repair. And, um, so respect, obviously, personal regard, the competence, because we need to be able to really garner our clients' uh, trust that we have the competence and that we really know that we're going to be able to do it, that we're taking them through a journey and that we know how to do that because of the vulnerabilities that they present with it's particularly important um, to be able to give them the assurance and the confidence in the trust that they're growing in us and in our workplace and our organisation that they will be competently um, supported and um, helped. And then integrity is the next of those. So I just want to take you through just a little, um, the next slide, which I think, oh no, I, sorry, I'm just finding my way around this. Hang on, I, I, it looks like my um, animation is going to work, which is great because I didn't think it was. So I just want to take you through these pieces one at a time. So first of all, a knowledge of our values. So if we think about respect, personal regard, our, um, our competence, and our ability to be able to competently do our work and that these things are values that we hold and we know that those are values and we're able to do that introspective work of looking within and understanding that these are our values, then the next step, and this is the step towards integrity, is aligning those values with our actions, that our actions and those values will be aligned. So it's walking the talk, if you like. And it's when we get the integration of values and actions that we have integrity. So integrity is the ongoing, reliable, consistent alignment of our values with our actions. That is integrity. And when we have integrity, we have the conditions for trust to develop. So the alignment of values and actions create the conditions for trust to develop. And trust, we know, is the glue that binds us across difficulty and difference. Or as Margaret Wheatley expressed it, and sorry, I'm just getting back in my notes to get it quite exactly right, um, that um, we can cope with almost anything. If we can rely on one another, we can cope with almost anything. So trust is the glue that binds us across difficulty and difference. And there is always difficulty and difference in um, connecting around the vagaries of other human beings in the complexity of workplaces and systems and particularly where there are specific challenges inside of that. 
So trust is a glue that we actually need to actively be conscious of in order to be able to do our work well and to bind us across that difficulty. And it's essential for, problem, uh, for positive problem solving. So if we're seeking to positively solve the problems that we encounter, um, we need the trust with others to be able to do that and to be able to keep it positive, which nourishes us all. And that leads to courage. When we have those things lined up, courage emerges from that. And we know that we need courage for leadership. And I think that this work that we do, this complex work with adults, actually it is, um, it is an area of leadership. We might think we're simply, uh, you know, in fact, simply teaching reading or writing. But actually we're traversing areas that are unknown when we think about the um, complexity of somebody's learning profile. We're often stepping into that area with some pillars of understanding around it, but in terms of the specifics of the complexity of every individual that we work with, we're traversing ground that, um, that we don't know completely certainly and that we do need to exercise leadership. So I think these concepts of leadership and relational trust as one of the essential qualities of leadership it's really important to hold even in the work that we do. We might not see ourselves as leaders, we might not be leading an organisation as such, but we are leading an individual through the complexity of their um, problem. And so we need those skills and we need to, I think, uphold them and honour them as, um, as leadership um, because that, that is our work. Um, so, yeah, trust. is like the silver sunrise on a river. And there's one other thing that I want to say, um, which I've been spending a bit of time in the last couple of years saying, and that is to think about what else opens trust and hope. It's the how of communication. And I think in specifically talking about relational trust in the way that I have, um, the, the way that we go about our connection and our communication with others that will support and inspire uh, and demonstrate respect and personal regard, bringing our competence and holding all of that together with our integrity is being really conscious of our other-mindedness and our benevolence and tenderness towards others in that other-mindedness and then following that up with action. And really this, these three things, other-mindedness, benevolence and tenderness with action, this is kindness. And I have this little quote here, and I've, I've just found this on the internet somewhere a long time ago, and I don't know where it came from, and I can't attribute it, unfortunately, that it was this simple statement, humankind, be both. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. That's beautiful. And uh, what... What a perfect end to it! You know, I, I love the um, the idea that humankind be both. It's it's really powerful, and it's um, you know, it's an important thing. I think, as Anne's pointed out, there, it's a great framework and an important framework to consider. And you know, I think we we all appreciate your insights, and I, I think that they're really powerful for the context in which many of us work. Um, and thank you for putting up those references as well, because I think that. Those sorts, the sorts of discussions that, that you know we can go away and have with, with colleagues and um, co-workers is just you know going to be really well supported by perhaps some of that reading and you know it's really appreciated. Um, mm. so there was a quick question that came up before we finish up. Um, I think Sue pointed out you know how, how do you not have too much empathy uh, with relational trust and I think. You know, many of our learners do come with with quite a lot of you know emotional needs that need to be met. And, you know, do you have any insights there? I think it's really important to meet the emotional need, and um, you know, we, and this is some of the you know the work that the circle of security really opens. And obviously, it's doing that in relation to children. But um, as many of my clients, my adult clients sitting in our reflective dialogue circles have pointed out very quickly, often on session two, they say, this is not just about kids, is it? And they're absolutely right, it's not just about kids, that the emotional needs that we have as human beings, um, you know, often our, our bad behaviour 
or the behaviour that we're not proud of is because there's an emotional need that's not being met. And so if we're not able to put that into words or to reach out and have that need met, then actually what comes out instead is a behaviour that uh, is seeking to be seen seek and, um, and unfortunately it might, it might not be a fit with what is you know what we regard as the correct social way to, to respond and of course you know for many of the people that I've worked with that inability to speak out um, ends up tipping over into acting out and which tips over further into crime and so being able to meet the emotional need and acknowledge it and listening I think that listening is really um, is really key and we are a talking society and I think that there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from indigenous knowledges in relation to listening and to understanding listening as a as knowledges in relation to listening and to understanding listening as a, a deep practice that is supportive of meeting emotional needs. But yeah, I mean, you know, some of these things, you know, there's not a simple, uh, you know, this can be done in 10 minutes kind of response and so often we are time bound as well that it, it can be tricky to to meet those emotional needs, but um, that's where our salve is. Yeah. No, that's very true. And, and yeah, oh, I, I just can't thank you enough, Rosie, for the for the beautiful insights that that you've brought to our webinar today. Um, and being now three, just after three thirty, we're, we're probably due to wrap up our AGM or well, the webinar part of our session today. So. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for, for coming and I'm sure you've all gained a lot from Rosie's presentation as have I and I appreciate her taking the time to spice up our AGM today. So thank you so very much Rosie and thanks thank to everybody who, who has connected with our AGM today. We appreciate the continued engagement and support of ACAL. As we're wrapping up, the survey is going to pop up here so if you could complete the survey and that will bring our AGM webinar to a close and hopefully we'll be connecting with you soon either through our engagement online, Facebook or our newsletters which you may be reading. So thank you everybody and thank you very much Rosie.